potential avenues to treat this, this topic. Uh, we'll start with uh, the presentation by Marshall Van Alstein, a professor at Boston University and research associate at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Uh, very happy to have you in Europe, uh, Marcel, for this event. Um, and then we'll have a, a, a panel discussion uh, in alphabetical order. I will start with uh, Annie Hellman, uh, the deputy head of Unit uh, Media Convergence and Social Media at DigiConnect European Commission. Welcome, Annie. Uh, it's uh, the unit that was very active in uh, discussions around the fake news uh, topic, and we are looking forward to hear uh, your views uh, and your activities on this. We have uh, Efi Kuchokosta, who is uh, the European Affairs uh, journalist at Euronews, to give us the media perspective. Welcome, Efi. And uh, we also have the pleasure to host uh, Thomas Mayrop Christensen, who is the managing director for EU Affairs and head of Brussels office of Facebook, a social media uh, platform to capture also the social media perspective of um, this issue. Before I give the floor to Marcel, I have prepared two slides with recent studies and some statistics relevant to the fake news pro uh, problem uh, to set the skin and then we go to Marcel. So uh, let's upload the slides if possible. Um, the, the first slide refers to one uh, very recent study uh, by colleagues of uh, Marcel at MIT, uh, which uh, referred to a study of Twitter. And uh, they, uh, it was published in uh, March in uh, Science. And uh, basically, uh, they uh, found, uh, uh, using data from Twitter, that uh, fake news diffuses significantly faster, uh, farther and deeper, and more broadly than the truth. And to give some uh, numbers, uh, fake uh, false news stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than the true stories. Uh, while um, uh, it takes also true stories about six times as long uh, to reach uh, uh, 1,500 people uh, as it does for false stories. So the penetration is um, much faster. Um, and uh, another interesting finding is that uh, we could uh, associate um, this uh, uh, spread of false news with uh, the so-called internet bots, which is basically web robots, uh, which uh, they have the specific task to, uh, uh, to disseminate uh, false information. But the study uh, goes further and it says that it is uh, not only that, it is also people that have the tendency to retweet uh, more often inaccurate news than uh, reality. Uh, the second study uh, is based on uh, Alcott and uh, Genco, and it is published in 2017 in Journal of Economic Perspectives. And basically, we can see the different channels in which uh, a consumer can uh, reach uh, to websites and also fake news websites. And we see that uh, the direct uh, bro uh, browsing is uh, one of the main channels. But in case of fake news, social media becomes also something relevant to investigate. So uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, start with Marcel, and we are looking forward for your insights. Well, good. Thank you. Uh, so let's see if we can introduce the next presentation. All right. Uh, first of all, let me just say it's an honor to be here because I think it's a really interesting problem and I find the European solutions are actually a little more active and in some ways welcome. Uh, so I'm actually glad to see that more is going on. Um, I'd like to make this interactive and actually get your attention on a couple of different possible solutions. Uh, and I want to give credit to the European Commission for having proposed several possible fixes and also uh, to Facebook for actually trying to recognize some of the problems and deal with it. Um, what I want to do is actually, I, I will be critical of Facebook in one or two instances, but also um, you know, quite supportive in other ways. Because one of the things I would like to do is to try to figure out what are the right solutions? If we were to ask you what would you really want to have happen, what would we want to have happen? and to balance the interests of corporations, balance the interests of societies and citizens, privacy questions, uh, and indeed even the dissemination of accurate information, not just fake information. So with that as preamble, certainly there's been much in the news. I also noticed that there were lots of folks from Facebook here, so I don't know if you're stacking the audience. Uh, <laughs> I, I am impressed at how, th how things are going. But at any rate, um, so it's been much in the audience in here. I like a couple of these just preliminary um, arguments. So among the newspaper journalists here, we have, you can go to the fiction and the nonfiction section of the news. Uh, there's other ways to look at that. 
uh, or you know, when you're entering it, if you're entering fake news, you're entering facts, or, or indeed it's even covering the economist uh, cover, our social media, the, any threat to democracy and how things are moving forward. Uh, so there's much attention in the news uh, these days. I want to start with a simple question that doesn't have a simple answer. So what is fake news? A couple of uh, journalists and a couple of academics have tried to summarize a, different, a number of different possibilities. Often it's assumed that it's misinformation or simply um, false information. I want to argue that alone isn't subtle enough to capture all the richness. So here's an example of false information. This was uh, put out by a Russian troll, a Tennessee GOP, not actually the Tennessee uh, Republican Party. Uh, and it was actually argued, no, this was massive crowd waiting outside a Trump rally in Phoenix. But, but media says everyone hates Trump. I'm confused. Again, trying to show that there was support for Trump in this particular image. What they don't point out is that this is actually an image of a uh, Cleveland Cavaliers game, right? It's a completely different audience in a completely different context. Um, it's also interesting, if you simply note the background data, the actual Tennessee Republican Party had only 13,000 Twitter followers, where this Russian troll account had 136,000, or 10 times uh, the number of uh, followers on there. It was really quite interesting. So that's false information. So these were fans of the Cleveland Cavaliers game. What about propaganda? Putin has been expert at trying to shape public opinion for a while, both domestically and abroad, and actually trying to use information to persuade or move uh, popular opinion. It might even be arguing, uh, my understanding is that in China, there are large numbers of individuals that actually create and retweet the equivalent of government policy out there, again, trying to sway. So you could look at that as propaganda. Is that fake news? What about parody? I like these two here. I don't know if you've had a Starbucks coffee, but here's Star Wars coffee. May the froth be with you. So if you get that much coffee and that much froth, there might be an element of it. Or uh, in the United States, we have McDonald's, wait, I'm gaining it. Um, these, are, <laughs> these are parody, right? Would you count that as fake news? Would you, would you wish to uh, curb that kind of speech in there? Another one's kind of interesting. What about intentional controversy? Here, a Russian account used uh, a, a Twitter handle, Blacktivist, and pointed out black people should wake up as soon as possible. Black families are divided, destroyed by mass incarceration and the death of black men. Trying to create friction in different voting blocks and trying to cause dissensus. Or you can imagine suppress voter turnout if they're angry with a white candidate instead of a black candidate. Again, this is used to foster intentional controversy uh, of another special account. Or how about unintentional error? Boris Johnson made some interesting claims. Um, he said, we will take back control of roughly 350 million pounds per week, argued this Brexiteer. In fact, if you look at the actual data, it might have been 250 million pounds, off by 100 million pounds. But in fact, even that's irrelevant. Compared to the shrinkage of the economy, estimated at 3% by 2020, or 1.3% decline in 2018, that's nothing. 250 million pounds compared to 1% drop in GDP is nothing. Right? You're looking at the wrong data if that's what you're focusing on. So that's another interesting error. Uh, and would you call that fake news? How would you actually position that? So each of these are different versions of it that are quite, kind of uh, troublesome. This is data from the report that came out in uh, March that um, Jorgos was just describing for us out of a role. It's wonderful. To give you the summary again, falsehood diffused significantly faster, farther, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in all categories of information. This was an impressive study. They tracked all Twitter feeds from 2006 to 2017 and used the categorization of false information done by six independent organizations that largely agreed with each other about 95% of the time as the classification mechanism. The orange is false information that was spreading, and the blue was accurate information. It's interesting, if we pick up on this data point that it was humans, not just bots, why was it happening? It's really interesting, but it also goes to what we might have to use to address the solutions. People retweet novelty. It is not novel, it's not interesting. But fake information is more likely to be 
interesting or novel, such as the Pope endorsing Trump, rather than true information, which, well, that kind of meets with your expectations, so why bother retweeting it? But that creates a problem if we're going to do things like a truth chaser to false information then maybe it's just not going to get very far. What was interesting is this statistical evidence of something we've heard for ages, right? Falsehood will be halfway around the world before truth has a chance to get its boots on. And so we've now actually, in effect, proven what we might have known uh, you know, before uh, in, a, in a kind of colloquial sense. So it's a really interesting challenge to how to actually deal, deal with these problems. So I also want to point out, fake news isn't new. False information has been around for a really long time. This is a plot of an Google, a Google Ngram study. So if you go to Google Ngrams and you look up the phrase false news as opposed to fake news, it's actually been around for a long time. And a matter of fact, there's some huge spikes over time uh, in false news. And actually, if we look at this little lump, it's kind of interesting. Fake news is the red line down here. And interestingly, we see a bump up in World War II. What was happening with fake news in World War II? Well, the Allies and the Axis powers were trying to dissuade each other's troops from fighting. So they were putting out fake news about their own victories in order to convince the other troops to stop doing it. This has been around for a long time. In effect, since as long as there's been a, a press or a way to try to publicly persuade people, it's an old problem. And in fact, we even have older words for it. It's sedition in the case of um, arguments against the king, it's blasphemy in the case of arguments against God, or slander in the case of arguments against individual citizens. And we've actually had laws to deal with each of those individual problems. So it's not necessarily a new problem, again, indicating how difficult this is as a challenge. It's also fun just as a bit of historical evidence. In the Court of Star Chamber, the truth was not a defense. In fact, all that did is it made the king harder to defend himself, because he was then having to defend against true information that, wasn't, that was being leveled against the king. Uh, so in the court of Star Chamber, that was not actually a defense. It's interesting how things have evolved over time. So again, these problems have been here uh, for not just decades, centuries. It's an interesting and old problem. Why is it a problem? Let's look at a couple of different reasons. One of these, of course, is decision error. So classic examples of decision error that we might think of in, in fake news would be miscast votes, things that you didn't understand, disenfranchised voters not showing up. Might be belief in or propagation of revisionist history. Another obvious ones would be the consumption of the wrong foods, medications, or prophylactics. What cures might you actually have? And you'd be making the wrong choices in those decisions. So decision error is a classic when we study it in economics. You build any of the models of decision error. Others might be balkanized, fragmented society. We're seeing lots of that today. Uh, we see it in anti-abortion. We see it in gun control. We see it in Brexit. We see it in immigration policy. Uh, we see it in vaccination policies. Each of these are deeply held views, almost bordering on ideology <coughs> each, of one or another side. But again, this leads to a less, uh, or at least a more divided society. And then, there's actual third-party harm. Here are instances from false information of actual harm taking place. So in India, news of a hoax cow killing actually led folks to lynch folks. This was news propagated on WhatsApp, but actually someone got seriously hurt uh, as an example of this. Many of you may have heard of the hoax, Clinton child sex ray being run out of a pizza parlor. All right? This led an individual to invade the pizza parlor and fire off a couple of shots. That's a problem, right? There are actual incidences of things happening. Or another interesting case, a Russian hacker published fake news on a state-run Qatar news site and inflamed diplomatic relations between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. All of these are serious incidences of real harm taking place as a result of fake news. Why is it a hard problem? So here it is, here are your actual consequences. Why is it hard? I need a couple of reasons. The first of these is simply veracity. How do you know when something's true or false? This is a really hard problem. As a matter of fact, I don't know many of you remember about three or four election cycles ago when there was Bush versus Gore, and it was a huge question because exit polls gave it to Gore. Then the actual vote gave it to Bush, 
Then there was the hanging Chad issue that would have tipped it back in favor of Gore. Then there was the um, Republican certification of the ballot that gave it back to Bush. And then there was another thing about counting uh, remote votes that hadn't been counted, which gives it back to Bush. And the Supreme Court eventually settled it in favor of uh, Bush, ultimately. So it flipped back and forth and back and forth. There's always, in some sense, an added bit or an added dimension that might flip the truth in another way. So determining truth is exceedingly difficult. The next question is, unlike the BBC or the New York Times, this isn't published by employees of the organization. Facebook doesn't write the news. These are third parties on top of the platform. So who should take responsibility for that? Right? Is it the source of that information? Should it be the platform as intermediary? Should it be the consumer of that information? So who should assume that liability? It's different than a traditional news organization that does take responsibility for the journalistic integrity of what it publishes and the people under its employment. Another one that's new, this one is secrecy. In the current mechanism, it's possible for folks to buy ads and whisper in the ear of a voter without others knowing about it. That's really different than if you had broadcast TV or broadcast radio where the other candidate finds out about it. So lots of things can be done surreptitiously in this way where it's not observed more broadly by other opposing candidates. Another one, of course, is velocity. We just saw that in the broad spectrum of how fast and how far fake news actually transits. So it happens to go farther than the truth. It's really quite uh, interesting. And then there's tenacity. Truth doesn't necessarily displace fiction. One, it's novel so folks don't redo it. Two, the ideologues don't tend to actually listen once they've got an embedded view. Or if it's repeated often enough, there are psychological reasons why folks now believe it to be true. So simply providing the truth in and of itself is often isn't sufficient antidote. I got to admit, I used to believe more information was the correction for misinformation. Unfortunately, we see both scientific evidence and the psychology evidence, that alone is often insufficient in order to uh, uproot deeply embedded beliefs that are false. It was interesting, even in the science article, it said a new system of safeguards is needed. So many of the best thinkers actually think this is a hard problem and actually had a really hard time proposing them. I want to say that the report was actually quite interesting. I'm going to give a list of what I, you know, I think is the whole summary of solutions proposed so far. I'm actually interested to see if you have further suggestions on that. And I, I, I want to acknowledge that the existing report from the EU says it's going to be revisited in a year. So hopefully there'll be additional things that we can actually do uh, by that time. So if we're going to solve the problem, one of the things we need to address is why do people do it in the first place? If we don't address the causes, if we only look at the effects, then we can't actually uproot the problem from its source. I want to give you three possible explanations as to why people produce misinformation or produce fake news. The first of these is for fun and profit. There are examples of Macedonian teenagers who got engagement and would actually simply make money off of advertising by boosting engagement. Controversy sells, right? So they could create controversy and they could make some money. So you could imagine an economic incentive to do it. The second one is sovereign intervention. You've got Putin hiring armies to actually go in and intervene in US elections or intervene in Brexit or intervene in French elections. Uh, so sovereign intervention is a way for them to try to meddle and actually intervene in that context. The third category are citizen ideologues that do it assuming the ends justify the means. They think a policy outcome is what they're trying to achieve. It doesn't really matter what information they use to get there. They want that as the final result. These, I would argue, at least a summary of some of the main mechanisms. I'd be entirely happy to get, add others to the list if you have them. But I want to make sure that we address at least this collection in the suite of metrics that we try to apply to solve the problem of fake news. So what happens if it's fun and profit? That one, happily, is the easiest. We, can, we have economic mechanisms to take away the profit motive. So imagine you apply economic incentives. You apply penalties, warranties, escrows amount. Um, a friend of mine even proposed maybe individuals could affiliate with institutions that would warrant those individuals, and those would get greater credibility. The economic incentives are actually pretty easy. You could imagine, for example, for examples like the Macedonian teenagers, you escrow the funds, and if it's subsequently shown that they have been disseminating fake information, you keep it. 
they don't get the money, or you even penalize them. Uh, so you'd actually fine them for things. But we can change the economic incentives in that. What's interesting about this is that small fines are no match for state actors. Uh, state actors can interfere. Putin's entirely happy to afford a much larger budget. So anything that would be the size of an ad budget, that's not about to dissuade him from his behavior uh, in there. Um, identification and banning is often the solution that's applied in that particular case. And indeed, asking an organization like Facebook to deal with Putin is tough. It probably needs to be a state-level intervention rather than a business-level intervention. Uh, so you may need something at a much higher uh, level in order to deal with something like a state actor. Putin doesn't have a right to vote in US, UK, or French elections. It, he just doesn't, right? So that's another question. And it's, it's, a, it's a problem that goes well beyond that of, of Facebook. The last one's kind of interesting, because we can't ban citizens. They have a right to speak. These are the ones where we can't simply pull them out of the system, and they don't respond to economic incentives. So if we're simply applying fees at the level of an ad budget, that's not going to change things very much. So we need solutions that are going to address each of these different things, but they're really different motives and really different mechanisms. So how do we address these different problems? So this is my best summary of the solutions that have been proposed so far. So I want to look at, one, crowdsourcing or using algorithms to identify the truth. Another possibility is labeling it. It's the equivalent of a product labeling, like for um, sugar, fat, you know, uh, against diabetes, or knowing, knowing the source of the information. Uh, there is banning the individuals or the, or the perpetrators. Another solution is educating the recipients so that they know whether or not they're likely to be consuming good things or consuming bad things, so they're less susceptible to influence by bad actors. Another one that's often proposed is the truth chaser in order to or improve discovery to reduce that influence uh, in there. Or lastly, you know, one that I know Facebook is already doing is trying to demote stories in the news feed uh, that, that are false and actually getting them less attention. Let's examine each of these. Uh, uh, please let me know if there are others that I'm miss missing from the list. I thought, this, I thought this was the best summary I had of existing solutions. Crowdsourcing the truth is actually difficult. Uh, again, proving that a claim is false is extremely hard. Knowing truth in any context is actually quite difficult. Um, another interesting element is who's going to do this. How many of you remember the Moody's credit crisis with the banking collapse? One of the big problems was the companies being raided were paying Moody's, who then wasn't motivated to sufficiently and accurately certify. Another element of this is what I, you know is well known as the New York State capital problem. If you survey a lot of people, what they think is the state of New York, they'll say New York City. It's Albany. Crowdsourcing gives you a beauty contest answer. It doesn't necessarily give you truth. So that's an interesting and troublesome solution. What about tagging and product labeling? Ideologues don't care. They just hate Hillary. So labeling this as misinformation, they're entirely happy to say that, yes, she's running a you know, child sex ring out of a pizza parlor. Because doesn't matter to them. This is part of the I, I identify with the I hate Hillary club. So ideologues don't necessarily respond to that. Another interesting problem of tagging and product labeling and most of these systems is this is just recursive. Then what you do is you discredit the certification agency. So rather than decertifying the source, you now decertify uh, in a public relations sense the party doing the tagging. So we've just moved the, the certification problem back one layer. It's quite common that in the far right press, they then dis try to discredit the liberal media as having a bias, in which case, again, they're simply uh, introducing another problem. And uh, content labels don't necessarily provide the means to contact the audience and undo the damage that might have, uh, that might have happened, um, right? You know, you know, if you're reaching individually to a white male coal miner in Appalachia, it's different than broadcasting on Channel 5 News. So you, don't, you can't actually undo the damage. Banning the individuals, an interesting one. This simply creates an arms race, so they return under a new ID. And citizens and ideologues have the right to vote their, voice their opinion. So that one's particularly troublesome, especially in the case of citizens. We can try to educate the consumers. Um, unfortunately, there's also very often a confirmation bias. Folks have a predisposition to a particular view. There was also a wonderful article done by Dana Boyd on, you think you want media literacy, do you? 
it actually points out lots of folks don't want to be educated. They're comfortable in their views, and how dare you presume to educate me? What makes your opinion more legitimate than mine? It's a really wonderful takedown of that particular argument. Um, and again, I, I recommend the article by Dana Boyd uh, on that. So many distrust those who would educate them uh, in those methods. Truth chasers, again, there's very little evidence that it actually has much effect. And once it's, the truth is simply posted, we now have statistical evidence, it doesn't spread. It just doesn't matter. So the, the pointing them toward the truth isn't necessarily a way to do it. Demoting stories is interesting, but one of the, one of the metaphors is this is analogous to spam. One of the interesting challenges there is, so it moves it down, but that motivates the suppliers to try new variations in order to bump back up the news feed. So it's an arms race again, where they're motivated to try new ways to get themselves back up to the, the news feed. So each of these, for various reasons, is a challenge. It's a hard problem. Let me suggest a couple of different mechanisms. So here's one way to think about it. Suppose we take a slightly different approach. Now I'm gonna to try to offer a solution that might be implemented on top of Facebook, and another one that might be required of Facebook, uh, or Twitter, or others of other social media. So here's one that I think that actually might make a slight difference. Oh, actually, but I want to first uh, identify um, a little bit more of the source on this. Which of these effectively change the incentives to produce fake news? Almost none of those do. Matter of fact, if we take a look a list of the seven different uh, uh, possibilities, only applying incentives and penalties, which, which only addresses the economic group, or banning the individuals, in some ways changes their incentives in there. So not many of these actually change the incentives for individuals to stop producing it. Again, one of the issues is we've got multiple parties involved. We've got the sources and the sharers, and we've got the readers, and we've got the platform. The sources are, in fact, the problem, and most of these solutions don't actually hit the source with a different incentive. So how are we going to do with that? I'm going to suggest a different kind of mechanism. Suppose we publicly downsample and delay. So I'm publicly going to say, let's suppose that you are caught propagating this information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to downsample and delay your specific social network. So right, instead of the false information looking like that, spread is going to start to look like that. Because if you had 1,000 followers, maybe I'll now randomly choose 100. If you were going out originally instantaneously, now your messages are going to go out next 24 hours, next two weeks, sometime in that time period. First thing that does is it automatically reduces the velocity and the spread of, third, of further disinformation. So if we take that chart, you actually see that you're reducing, the, you're changing the relative proportions of disinformation. So it's, one, it's immediately addressing and putting friction on the messages themselves as one instance of it. But it has an additional property. One of these, so what I'm going to do is publicly to say, if your reputation is sterling, your number of followers and your speed of dissemination is completely unlimited. In contrast, if you are caught propagating false news, either as source or as sharer, I'm going to downsample and delay. What's this do? It shifts to ex post verification, which is far easier, and it shifts the incentives. Now think about it. Even if you are Putin or an ideologue, what this now says is it, your goal is influence. And if I'm going to achieve influence, now I have to use true information to do it. In general, that's OK, because we want policy debates based on true information, if it comes from citizen ideologues or whomever. But what this does is it changes the incentives and pushes it back on the source to say, OK, if I'm going to persuade people, I can't use fake news. So even if you're a citizen ideologue hating Hillary, now you have to use true information as a way to actually make that persuasion. So I want to publicly downsample and delay as a way to try to change the incentives. This is something that could be implemented on Facebook or Twitter without further intervention. It's a simple way of managing this. Ideologues, in order to disseminate their views, need to build their reputations. This is a classic gossip element. Reputations quickly lost and slowly gained suggest even ideologues will behave better. We've tried to shift the burden. 
I want to go after a couple of the other ideas. And I want to try to press on some of the other contexts. So this is, going to take, this is going to take a moment. So we'll actually see if we can actually go after some of the definitions. And again, go after why this is a problem. OK? So let's take a look on some of what fake news is. This is fact versus fiction. Is Pluto a planet or is Pluto an asteroid? You're going to publish a story that says it is a planet. He publishes a story that it's an asteroid. Is this going to affect your life? When was the last time you visited Pluto? <laughs> right? It's an example of it's true information or false information. It's not necessarily going to change your life. How about this one? This is a restaurant near where I live. Uh, it was Jay's, a wonderful Asian fusion place. And its slogan is, eat at Jay's, live forever. <laughs> Anybody believe that? <laughs> Inquirer publishes a story that Rita Hayworth is back from the dead. Does anyone believe that? Has anyone suggested a deep intervention that suggests the Inquirer cannot publish that story? All right? Uh, what's interesting, I like the Jay's example. It's particularly fun because there was a dueling slogan uh, from the restaurant next door that says, uh, oh, I actually come back to that. Here, the truth of Pluto's status, claims of longevity, or an actor's vivacity, every one of these is scientifically verifiable. It just doesn't matter. These are all true examples of true information that just aren't important. False information, sorry. False information that just aren't important. OK? I like the dueling logo next to it. It says, eat here and die happy, <laughs> which was the restaurant next door to Jay's. All right? So I thought that was a really nice example of dueling logos in there. I'll give you one or two other examples that are kind of fun. OK? This is world's hottest chili pepper. OK? This one is world's biggest cheese taste. World's smoothest shave. You can see the dog face mirrored in her leg. <laughs> okay? This one is world's sharpest knife. This one, world's most comfortable chair. <laughs> That's provably false for half the world's population. Okay? The issue here is exaggerated truth has long been used for rhetorical or mnemonic effect. None of these are true information. None of them matter. All of them are used in advertising currently. What about this one? This is fact versus fiction. This is selective information. Many of you might have seen this before. It's kind of interesting. So this looks like there's a real threat. This looks like there's real aid. In fact, that's what's actually happening. Selective presentation of true information in order to tell a story consistent with your worldview as opposed to a broader, more accurate worldview. Let me give you a wonderful example. Also, it occurred in the last several weeks. Trump visited uh, Indiana to celebrate the e economic growth uh, in there. It was interesting. Uh, Trump supporter argued that Elkhart, as a reason to support Trump, Elkhart, Indiana, unemployment was 20% under Obama and 3% under Trump. That is a completely true statement. And what it omits is the fact it had already fallen to 4% under Obama. Momentum simply carries it on to 3%. Extraordinary, different representation of what's actually happening in here. This is true information presented as a way to tell opposing stories. So are you going to decertify that? It's a very interesting problem because it's actually true, and you're using it to tell, uh, to make, uh, make you know, inferences that are false. How about these? Each of these are also true information. After some of the shootings, the Russian troll account actually put out, maybe if we defund the murders at Planned Parenthood, we'd have enough money to provide armed resources at schools and protect them, you know, protect the NRA and others. This was being used to stir up, descent, uh, again, balkanization afterwards. Or uh, black activists put up, and never forget that pan Black Panthers formed groups to protect people from the KKK. Again, these are all true information used to be stir up distrust and stir up uh, voter hatred uh, in, the, in the electorate. Right? These troll accounts flooded after each of these events um, cause additional information to be propagated uh, afterwards. You know, especially even after uh, white police shot black um, men, this happens all over again again, to inflame tensions. It's quite remarkable how uh, this true information is then being used to cause trouble. Much false information doesn't matter 
much true information does. So is it truth or falsity? That's the real issue. If it's not truth or falsity, maybe it's harm. Maybe it's the damage that's occurring from these different things. So let's explore that question. I want to give you several examples where harm is actually fixed. I don't know how many of you have heard the story of Vitaly Borker. He's a really interesting guy that exploited a loophole in the PageRank algorithm. He would sell faulty eyewear, some faulty sunglasses. What would then happen is folks would then complain and ask for a refund, and he would personally threaten them. And then folks would blog about it and cite his site. What does that do? Boots the page rank. Well, folks automatically assume that they have a high page rank, then it must be the right one to play. So they'd go purchase. He would send ship faulty all eyewear. They'd complain and blog about it and boost his page rank. It was, so the original page rank didn't check valence. It only checked number of links. Was it a good link or a bad link? Now it adjusts for valence. But the platform fixed the problem because the users are, in effect, getting harmed. Apple exercises bouncers' rights to exclude pornography, hate speech, and viruses. The platform fixes the problem. Uber now protects people against fake routes, or it protects um, drivers against people getting sick in their car. Again, there's damage that's occurring on platform, and Uber fixes it. They didn't originally do that, but they have moved to do so. Airbnb now offers a million dollars insurance for folks having their homes trashed, and they also protect people if they're injured uh, inside the home, or things of that sort. Again, protecting the participants in the ecosystem. Platforms try to protect their users against mistreatment. Alibaba. I don't know how many of you know about Alipay. It's now one of the dominant forms of monetary exchange in China. It was developed as an escrow mechanism to protect the users. Originally, folks were transacting. It might be the case that a buyer and a seller would show up to transact in the city. This was before the, the, the Alipay had been developed. And then what would happen is the buyer might snatch the good from the seller and ride off on a motorcycle through the crowd. No way to trace them. There's no way to So they put up together an escrow service, which eventually became Alipay, solving a social problem. It's a wonderful example of protecting the users. Facebook. If you introduce a new video service, and VD did this, and start to spam the users in order to generate your own new business, what happens? Facebook logically turns off your API access. They're protecting the users. That's a good thing. eBay punishes buyers who don't pay and sellers who don't ship. It protects the users. It'll boot you off the platform. If you lie about your products, it'll also boot you off the platform. It's got mechanisms to do that. What's different? What's happening? If the harm isn't the issue, how do we address the question of fake news? What's really going on here? There's some other insight that we can use to borrow another mechanism. Let me give you another interesting example. All right? Imagine, in this case, a Bottega Veneta bag selling for $3,000. That's if you go online and actually try to buy a, buy a real one or go down the street in, in Paris uh, or Belgium. You might be able to apply, uh, get one for that, uh, that price. Okay? Um, but then if you go to actually go to uh, Alibaba, you might find the $50 version of it, complete with certificate of authenticity. Is that an authentic bag? Does the buyer think it's an authentic bag? Of course not. That is a counterfeit. All it needs to do is look sufficiently good. They're happy getting it. The buyer doesn't complain. The seller doesn't complain. And the platform doesn't complain. Who complains? Bottega Veneta. They're not party to the transaction. What about fake news? The Clinton Foundation convenes businesses for NGOs to improve global health. Like, um, right? But in fact, they've been accused of sponsoring occult religion, sex trafficking, and paying for Chelsea Clinton's wedding. Right? What's going on here? What's interesting is that the creator doesn't complain of the fake news. The resharer doesn't complain. And originally, Facebook didn't complain because they were getting engagement out of this. Who complains? Hillary Clinton off platform complains. It's an externality. It's a negative externality. What I want to argue is market failures that occur on platform are self-correcting. Market failures that occur off platform are not self-correcting. That's one of the key challenges here. The real issue is externalities, harm that occurs off platform. As an example, I like to give you a little bit of, the, you know, here's the congressional testimony. This is a direct quote. It's actually quite interesting. We did not take a broad enough view of our responsibility. That is exactly the consequence of a negative externality. You don't see 
the damage that's occurring because it's invisible to you. It's occurring off platform. It's a negative externality. We have a host of economics to deal with negative externalities. We have a, a body to, uh, to deal with that. To give you examples of it, consider anti-vaxxers that are discouraging people from vaccinating. Well, harm occurs off platform. Why? Because we get instances of disease now spreading through the population. That's not on the platform. Or shots fired over Pizzagate. That's not happening on platform. That's in the real world off the platform. Or maybe we get orangutans for president, right? Maybe these are other consequences. I don't, can't claim whether or not this was actually the case or not, but it's a consequence of perhaps off platform uh, activity that's taking place, right? Again, market failures on platform are corrected. Market failures off platform are not corrected. That's another interesting example of this. So here's an interesting way to think about this. We need to combine knowledge of the interaction with knowledge of the harm. We need to move those two things together. You, know, you need to have a broad enough view in order to solve it. There are only there are very two simple solutions for that. One, we can pull the outside information into the platform. I'm going to argue that's a bad idea because one, it creates an extraordinarily powerful center without competition. Two, it doesn't necessarily align the incentives, right? Even though you have the information, it hasn't aligned the incentive to actually go fix it. And three, there may be such a variety of externalities, you may not necessarily even capture all that information. Another possibility is we do the opposite. We go to transparency. We make knowledge of the interaction public so that it moves off platform. In this case, we push the internal information about the interaction off one. This creates competition and decentralization in that information. Two, it solves the secrecy problem. You're no longer whispering to the coal miner in Appalachia in a way that no one else sees it. So Clinton could go in and address messages, advertisements that were bought by the Russians. And three, the parties that are harmed actually have the information on which they can act. So we've joined the knowledge of the interaction to knowledge of the harm by moving and making that transparency. So suppose we did the same thing. Well, actually, no. So Facebook might object, but this is our trade secret. This is our private information, right? These are our algorithms, our ad models. That's a perfectly reasonable objection. But how does intellectual property law work? Trade secret isn't absolute. If we allowed trade secrets, why do we allow trade secrets? It's to prevent unjust enrichment. It's also so that once you invent something really cool, and I go reinvent it because I see what you're doing, I've learned something. That's a positive externality. You've actually allowed innovation to happen in the marketplace, a positive externality. What's interesting in this case is that the negative externalities are swamping the positive externalities. And that's a reason to avoid the trade secret in this specific instance, if we're going back and examining our intellectual property law. So imagine that we go to transparency in the following way. Imagine what we do is we avoid the offending trade secret in the specific interaction. The greater the rule would be the greater the potential for negative externality, the sooner the information must become public. As an instance, imagine you then, but you also have to craft this narrowly. We have to balance the interests of all the parties involved. So suppose we say we craft the disclosure narrowly only just broadly enough to address the externality. So you imagine you might be this, so users' personal data, their friends list and their posts, that's not part of the externality. That's not made public. But if a Russian account is buying ads about Clinton, that becomes public immediately. One could imagine then a policy within which it's exactly analogous in the United States to you have to label who bought a political ad. Well, in this case, if you make that transparent, the third parties can actually then respond immediately in that particular data. Non-political ads such as biggest cheese taste, hottest pepper, and closest shave, there's no externality. We don't care about that. But if it's a Add on Brexit, if it's an add on Trump, if it's an add on Clinton, that's an issue where it should be public and the transparency should be made available in order that parties affected can address the issue. All right? This has another, e another interesting implication. So, uh, you know, full trans uh, action disclosure of ad buyer identities conduct does not compromise friend lists or prior calls. So there's an interesting relevant, but it has another interesting property here. All right. What does this imply? Now, Facebook has an interesting choice. Knowing the law, you have a choice of which ads to take. Think about it. What happens is, 
if an ad category has the prospect of a negative externality, you take the ad and disclose. So you make the money, but then what happens is the information is now publicly available. Alternatively, you don't take the ad, but then the harm doesn't occur. It's an interesting trade-off, because what this implies, the firm is now internalizing the externality. This becomes more socially optimal. If, in fact, the ad buy was valuable, then it would, should have taken place. This is, again, balancing corporate and social interests. But if the ad buy then has an externality, then it also becomes public in order that the externality can become addressed. We have a deeper solution that causes the firm to internalize the negative effects of negative externalities as another way to address the possible problems, and it's more socially optimal. So this was the story. For reasons of veracity, liability, tenacity, secrecy, velocity, fake news is a really hard problem. The motives include economics, state interference, ideology. Fake news, I would argue, is less about veracity than about harm, and also less about harm on platform than harm off platform. We have to be very precise about what's actually happening. The standard solutions, taxing bad behavior, crowdsourcing truth, labeling, demoting, educating users, they rarely address the underlying deeper issues. I argue the deeper issues are, one, the sources need to be motivated not to produce it. And most of the solutions don't do that. Two, knowledge of harm is not paired with damage done by the externality. And we need to merge those two things. Once that's done, we get a more sophisticated solution. The solutions are applying friction to the communication of those that lie. This causes them to lie less often. This moves their incentives and puts the burden back on the sources. And we avoid the trade secret in the offending information that causes the negative externalities, making it possible to uncover where the damage is occurring and then actually go in and correct it. So I would argue those are different solutions than the ones that have been proposed, perhaps with ways of going after the main mechanisms. OK. So with that, I'm very happy to turn it back over. Thank you very much, Marcel. It was very challenging, I think, to provide um, uh, a fake news illustration. There are so many dimensions, as you said, and um, also to go further by proposing some specific uh, question, uh, solutions that uh, I'm sure that uh, will generate some questions from the audience. Um, uh, just uh, because we are a little bit out uh, uh, of time, I will give the floor directly to the panelists. Uh, two uh, uh, comments. Uh, this is a work in progress, and we're looking forward to see your work published. Um, the um, uh, the panelists uh, didn't have access to uh, the um, uh, ideas presented before, so I asked them to, um, in their initial talks, to um, for, uh, to present their own views on the problem and potential solutions. But we will be very happy uh, to also receive comments on these ideas. Uh, secondly, uh, just for avoiding confusion, uh, referring to the economics and the economics incentives, you said that it is the easiest part. Uh, you refer to uh, Balkan country to avoid uh, confusion. Macedonia, the Greek province, is not referred to your story. It's the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. So uh, I turn to Effie. Uh, OK, whatever, because you said before that she was being was uh, It was uh, presenting a okay. political order, but for you. I got it. So I'll try to be brief, as uh, Mr. Marshall was quite long, so that we cannot uh, be out of, uh, of the time frame. Uh, first of all, some remarks for what uh, Marshall said before. Uh, as a journalist, what I have to say is that, no, I don't agree. Truth alone is the issue. For us, it is, and how we go and how we reach the truth, actually, because we talk about news. And what I wanted to say is that as, you know, this term fake news that we're talking about today is quite trendy and it's getting very weaponized by many political forces uh, around the world. I would like to do the distinction, a clear distinction between what it is fake news and what it is uh, media bias or uh, media misinformation. 
Uh, and there, uh, what I want to say is that fake news is something much more dangerous <laughs> than uh, media bias, because media bias is something we know very well. Uh, and media market, traditional media market and media companies are accountable for that. It is easy to find. They are open to criticism. There are some conducts and laws for that. So it's very easy to, to lose credibility and pay for it. And sometimes they are obliged to correct what they've said. Something that we don't see when there is fake news on social network, uh, uh, on the social network and on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, and that's a real problem that cannot be tackled so far. What I can say is that when the media market, the traditional media market, was really alarmed by what, by what it is, the fake news, was in 2016 when we had two major events. It was Brexit and it was, of course, the United States elections. And why we were so alarmed is because we saw that our tools, our traditional tools, including the polls, are not working anymore. Uh, because there are many different alternative sources, especially on Facebook and Twitter and other kind of um, social network pages, uh, that are beyond us, that have overpassed us. Uh, we had before many signals for that. I think both uh, political forces and the media market had these signals, but really ignored it. But when you know, they've seen that there is real influence on political campaigns, election campaigns, then there is a problem that we have to face. Uh, regarding the traditional media market, there's been, of course, a, a transformation over these latest years because of the digital revolution. Uh, and this is a problem that we're still facing. Uh, because it was not tackled also, I, I can say that journalists ha don't have the same uh, working conditions as before. They don't have the same role as before. Uh, of course, I have to, to speak about the failures, their own failures, uh, because there was, and we have to admit that, that, there was a gap and a vacuum to be filled in. And then we've seen that social network, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc., they did that uh, for us because we didn't realize that really uh, the broadcast system or the press system, the traditional ones, uh, became too much politicized and sometimes even the audience uh, realized that they cannot, they're not connected to them and their problems. So it was easier to go somewhere else to find alternative sources of information. Uh, now regarding the solutions of that, uh, as you asked me to say something about the EU Commission proposals and what is the role of the EU Commission, I want to say that for Europe it's quite different than the United States or other countries because many media-related issues are still left to the national level and national governments. Of course, the EU Commission can do a lot uh, as they did with uh, this high-level task force to, to work on it and find some tools. But of course, their role is more to, to give some guidelines, to try to engage national governments. But of course, there has to be political willingness. And we are not sure that there is political willingness, at least from everybody. Because as I said before, uh, this fake news uh, phenomenon is very useful for many governments for political reasons. Uh, and we've seen that also in Europe in some election campaigns. Uh, I would say an example with Germany, uh, with all the stories before the elections concerning regarding the refugee crisis. And this is really it can become very dangerous because it not, doesn't affect only uh, an election result, but also it can lead to real violence towards people. It can really form the conscience of the people. That's why I think that political leaders and governments should really, really commit themselves into new legislations, into holding into account all these social platforms, social network platforms, and because the key word here, and there I agree with you, is responsibility. And I think that now, uh, as we see all this monster created in front of us, we have to realize that, yes, Facebook has to be treated as a publisher. Yes, we have to see that, uh, because it's happening. Or, uh, of course, your proposals are uh, even more detailed, you know more about uh, these tools. Uh, but of course, for me, it's more like a political will to do something more uh, in terms of legislation, but not in terms of putting more censorship or controlling or really uh, putting limitations on uh, media freedom, because this is my main concern and fear. And I would like to finish uh, here and give the floor to the other yes. speakers.
Thank you very much, uh, Ophian. Uh, Effie, and uh, thanks also for bringing these additional insights also uh, referring to uh, Europe and the European member states. Uh, I will give the floor now to Thomas. Uh, we hear a lot about Facebook up to now, so you are the guy to talk now about us. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for allowing us to come today. We're really happy to be part of this discussion. It's an important topic, and um, it's an issue we take very, very seriously. Um, you can say, and uh, Marshall showed a picture of our CEO, and, and you can say that, you know, that showed that we were, maybe, we were maybe not fast enough to realize that there was an issue here we had to deal with. Uh, I think we caught on to it fast after that. And we have done a lot to uh, invest in solving this issue. Um, I think, as Marshall as well said, that this is hard. I mean, if this was simple, uh, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here still discussing the issue. It is not an easy issue. And it's not an easy, easy issue because it is not one issue. It is multiple issues. It is not something that can be solved with one solution, I think, but something that requires multiple solutions. Uh, I, I also want to say that I think we have every incentive in the world to deal with this issue. And I, I, I actually do not agree with you, Marshall, that we do not care about externalities on our platform. I would say we care deeply about that, not just because we're humans and we care about impact in the real world, but it's also very much in our interest, right? I mean, we have seen challenges to our reputation because we have been accused of you know, overlooking things and not being quick enough to act and we have tried to take action on it, right, for those reasons. So I think we care deeply about the world uh, around us and that the interactions that, you know, social media creates are meaningful and helpful to people's lives. So I, I think we have every, every incentive to, to deal with this issue uh, for, 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 uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper manner. Now, when that's said, I, I, I want to say that there's the challenge here as well that, you know, we are dealing with issues that are either against our community standards on Facebook when you sign up. There is a, a, a number of rules that you know, we have created that, um, that talk about what you can and cannot do on our, on our website. You cannot bully people, or cannot put hate speech on there. And there are rules like that uh, on the platform that we enforce. There's also legislation, right? There's, there's laws against terrorist propaganda or hate speech, at least in Europe, uh, that we also uh, uh, deal with. But the issue we're dealing with here is that most of the stuff that we're, that we're addressing here isn't, isn't illegal, right? isn't against uh, anyone's terms of use necessarily. Some of it is, and I'll get back to that, but not necessarily. And I think, you know, I, I, I like to look at it this way that uh, truth is a really gray matter, right? I mean, there, there's, there's something that's absolute truth and there's something that's absolute false, but there's a lot in between. And that's, that's the difficulty. And I sort of like to have this, if you have this graph where you on one axis you have, you know, the amount of truth in something being, being set, right? Zero truth at one end and 100% truth at the other. And then on the other axis you will have, what is the intention of this person that is putting out this information? Is there an intention to mislead, right? So if you have that category, so if you look at the bottom of that, and you look at people that, where there's someone posting something that's not really true, there's not a lot of truth in it, and, but there's no intention to mislead, that's just wrong, right? That's just wrong. You know, it could be maybe claiming the earth is flat. Uh, okay, I mean, that, that's just wrong, right? But I don't have any, it's my belief, right? So it, it, that's, just, um, that's just wrong. At the other end, you can say, well, there's something that's actually true, and, you know, I have... I have a, there's a high amount of truth and there's no intention to mislead. That's what we call being right, right? If you go to up the scale on intention to mislead, you know, you will have people where there will be very little truth and a lot of intention to mislead. And I think Marshall mentioned some examples of this earlier where the person that posted the picture from the Trump rally, for example, most likely knew very well that that information was false, right? That was a hoax. It was a, it was a deliberate attempt to mislead people, right? And then there's the last category, which is probably the most difficult one, and that's the category where there is um, uh, quite a lot of truth, but there's probably also an attempt to mislead or to at least manipulate, right? And, and, and we all do that, right? I mean, we, we all, 
have some truth, that we try to build our arguments on and to lead people towards a direction of travel that we believe is right, whatever it is. And sometimes we go too far. Sometimes we don't represent the truth in, in the right way or the full truth. And Marshall had some examples of like what we call selective statistics, let's call it that, that we used in certain ways to, to you put forward a certain view. And that's very hard to deal with in, in, in these situations, right? How far can you go? When, where's the border where it becomes too much, right? So what, what, what we're trying to do uh, on our platform is that we try to address this issue from, from multiple angles. And, 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 and Marshall talked about some of them earlier here today. I think we are making progress. Um, we have um, hired about 15,000 people to deal with issues in this area around safety. We will be at 20,000 by the end of the year. Um, and we are applying a number of, uh, of tools and techniques to, to, really, to really get into this. And um, um, the first one, which uh, I think, Marshall, you called the easiest one, and, I, and, and maybe you're right, it is easy, but it's still, it's still not something you just do. But it is about the economic incentives that, that, that we're dealing with here. And, you know, when we talk about false news, quite a lot of it, we have discovered, is there for monetary reasons. There are people that want to make money uh, out of, uh, out of uh, presenting people with information, clickbait, you know, uh, ad farms, things like that, where people are tricked to clicking on a link, they go to a web page because they thought there was some news story of interest to them, but really it's full of ads and, and the site just want to make money. So we have applied different technologies to recognize these websites, to look at, at uh, headlines. Is it clickbaity? What actually happens at, on that website? Is it 90% ads? Probably not something that's going to interest our users very much. And you then get a penalty for doing that, right? For, for you know, showing that you can either get deleted or significantly downranked in, in, in the newsfeed for having websites that look like that. And that is turning the in economic incentives on its head so it's more difficult for the people that, you know, might want to invest. And we also punish people by disabling their ability to use our advertising model, right? So it's like if they were able to spend 19, 19 cents on advertising and then they made 20 cents on, on advertising on their site, there's an economic model, one cent every time, right? But if you make it so it will cost them 21 sense to make 20 cents, there's, there's not an economic incentive there. So those are some of the things that we're working on when it comes to dealing with the, with the economic side of things. The other thing, and, and, and we are seeing an impact on that, of that. Uh, the other thing I think is about, and this is where, you know, when, when it comes to maybe uh, state actors or actors with political intent, uh, a lot of that we have discovered, uh, at least on our platform, and, and Facebook is a platform where, you, uh, where we have something called a real name policy. That means you are there with your name. You, you, you are not allowed to be anonymous on our platform. So um, what we have seen about a number of these um, uh, actors that have political intent to mislead is that they use fake accounts. They have botnets or other functions where they try to operate systems that um, put in a view that thousands and thousands of people are like supporting Trump or supporting Hillary or whatever. Um, but those are fake accounts. Those are not real, right? And we have developed uh, artificial intelligence and other methods for, uh, for addressing that issue and are taking down a very, very significant amount of, uh, of accounts that are fake, especially around elections, but all the time. And we're actually being public about that. You can go and look in our transparency report and you will see how many, how many accounts we, 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 we remove. Um, is that an arms race? Yeah, it is an arms race, right? <laughs> it is an arms race. They, they will try to trick us to hide that they're not real. And you know, Yes, they will. But that is an arms race and I, I'm quite confident that, we are, that we're moving in the right direction uh, on, on this issue. Now, um, that being said, I think there are also things about information and journalism online that we have to deal with here. I think journalism, too, has to develop into a digital age and to deal with some of these issues. And I think it's been pointed out earlier that not all of these issues around fake news and are, are, are new at all. Maybe the speed of uh, distribution is higher or we have more ability to actually spread news today than we had earlier. But um, what we have done is that we have um, worked with... Um, fact-checking organizations that sign up to certain code of conduct 
uh, for example. So either our technologies will see that a story is spreading fast and hence deserves maybe to be checked out, or uh, someone is telling us, whoa, uh, have you seen this story? I think, you know, I, I, I think this deserves you know, to be checked. And we have uh, then uh, fact checkers that do that and, 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 and make decisions. And for us, it's really important that those fact checkers are not us. Right? We, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. We don't want to be the people making decisions uh, about uh, what is true and what's not true. And I also think that, you know, the, the, it, it, we also got into a little bit of tricky territory there, I think, Marshall, when at least as, as our, I understood you, that we should sort of be making decisions as who was sort of, who it was okay could put political ads on Facebook or not. That also quickly, I think, maybe I misunderstood, but that also at least would be something that we would not yeah, like to become the arbiter. Okay, good. Then I, then I misunderstood. That's good. Because, I mean, on the transparency side of things, we, we agree. And we're working on different methods of addressing the issues around um, political advertising and transparency and make it possible for, making it possible for people to see who an advertiser is, who's behind this ad. And originally, you could see who's targeting me, right? who's, who's, who's putting uh, ads to me. And that's interesting. But it's actually maybe also interesting to see what ads are you getting, right, that I don't see. Right? So we have worked uh, on, new, uh, on a number of new products in that area. Uh, one of them that will be launching very soon, uh, also here in Europe, is one where you can actually go to a page and you can say, what ads are this page putting out on, on Facebook? And even if it's targeted at women in uh, Italy, I will be able to see that this page is actually targeting a certain group. Uh, and, and, and the message that's being sent to them. So that's one example of trying to create more transparency and also uh, more responsibility from those that drive political advertising to uh, what they're doing. So, I mean, there are many more things and, and we want to have time for discussion, so I'll stop here. But I, I, I think that the, the, um, the answer to the, to, the, to the challenge we have here is that there's not one answer. There are multiple things that need to happen uh, to solve this issue. And at the other end of it, of course, is that there's also freedom of expression, right? I mean, you can have strange, uh, these views that other people might view as strange, but you're allowed to have them, and we do not want uh, freedom of expression to suffer from these efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for explaining to us uh, your views and also your activities in uh, facing this problem. Uh, Anne, the floor is yours. Uh, looking forward for you. Is it working? Yes. Okay, good. So, hello everybody, good to be here too. Um, our, we, had, we were given a task um, half a year ago, more or less, to basically tackle all of this that, have, that was discussed here in kind of easy terms, saying that, well, we really don't like this false information online, so do something about it, and by end of 2018, please. Um, so that was kind of challenging which also means that we have put uh, ruthlessly pressure on our stakeholders like uh, Facebook has, has experienced. Um, so, in fact, when, when we started the process of tackling fake news, so to speak, we needed to go through all of this that has been discussed here. We needed to understand what are we talking about. Secondly, we needed to understand well, is this really a problem? The Commission should look at issues which are a problem to the European citizens or organizations or, or firms. So what we did is that we had a really wide, wide, possibly wild also, but wide stakeholder consultation in many ways. We organized a multi-stakeholder conference where we invited the platforms, the fact-checkers, civil society, researchers, and uh, as widely as we could, all the possible kind of stakeholders in the issue of, of uh, false information online. Also, people who are worried about specific kind of facing, uh, false, false information online, such as uh, these, uh, these problems of, of vaccines, which are a threat to the, the kind of health of society. So. This consultation gave us an idea of what we are discussing about and also made it clear that we have to decide and limit on what we can re react somehow. Um, in that context and in the wider, the next steps, we 
decided to focus on that disinformation online, which is harmful to the society or to, to its people or to the political process, to us in general, but is not illegal as the illegal part is covered by legislation. So we focused on that. Um, we had a workshop with member states equally to understand, well, in the member states, what is the issue? How, how do they see this problem of, which has been called here fake news? We have decided it's disinformation, but it doesn't matter. Um, so we asked, uh, what is your problem concerning fake news? It divides Europe in, uh, in a clear way, not divide as in different parts, but the answers are different, different parts of Europe. The Eastern Europe has a problem of uh, political propaganda. It's, it comes from each Eastern European country. Um, the Southern Europe has a problem with migration and a lot of disinformation about it, partly also in the Middle Europe. Terrorism was an issue brought up by Belgium, for example. Of course, those countries who have faced it recent, recently. Um, the electoral process was an issue everywhere. Everybody is worried about that. But if, especially those countries who were facing elections uh, in, in due time when we discussed this. So we have a picture of what is worrying Europe, and it's very diverse. The problem remains the same, that false information online may have very severe uh, consequences. So we learned that. We learned also that research, the technical research, not only kind of political research, but the technical research on the phenomenon of how social networks work, how the information spreads, uh, what differences there are, what kind of clustering there is, what kind of possible echo chambers there are, is being studied in a kind of explosive amount of interest, but not enough. So we need to do more of that so that we have a clear basis for our future actions. So we did all of that. At the same time, we started a public consultation to ask the citizens and organizations how they see the problem. We started a Eurobarometer to kind of make sure that this is statistically correct. That said that most of the people perceive that, yes, uh, fake news is a problem, roughly speaking. Uh, they also felt that they see it quite a lot. A big, a big amount of people say that they see fake news all the time. So it's, it's a bit questionable how we uh, kind of interpret it. What is interesting is that 26% only trusted social media, and on people under 50, 72% take that as their main source of information and news. So uh, the situation is interesting. Of course, there are details in these statistics, but um, we have a challenge. So to do some real action, we set up a high-level group to which we... Uh, invited people to express their interest from uh, platforms, from um, um, search engines, uh, online actors, uh, journalists, uh, media, broadcasters, um, civil society organizations, fact checkers, etc. And that was set up very quickly. In the mid-January, 15th of January, it had its first meeting and it in fact produced a report uh, called which I have here, so I can just say the name, a multidimensional approach to disinformation. So that, that was a report of the independent high-level group on fake news and online information, online disinformation. And that report um, was a very important input for us. It's okay, I don't need input for us when we started to draft our communication on, on what actions to take. The communication was published in April, and now, instead of like our, our uh, chair said that we are, what we have done, but it's just accelerating. In January, we thought that, oh God, when this is done, communication over, we can relax a bit. But unfortunately, now it, it is very intense because the same really strict and hard deadlines that we are, or the timeline that we have, just seem to accelerate. So the communication has some actions for our different stakeholders and for us. A code of practice for the social media online platforms and for advertisers online is to be drafted. And that code of practice should see ways to tackle uh, these issues that have been mentioned here mainly. 
uh, issues like uh, you know this clickbait, the system that having a false uh, false account may bring you revenue. How to tackle that and and some other issues. I can just show that here's a list of issues in our communication, such as the you know advertisement placement, transparency about sponsored content, especially important in elections. Uh, how to close fake accounts, um, indicators of trustworthiness, etc. So there's a list of things that we would like the online platforms, those, let's say just social media and advertisers to commit themselves to. The idea is now that we go for self-regulation. We don't want to do regulatory actions immediately. Regulation at EU level is possible on, on these kind of areas. But we would first like to, because this is such a complex thing, it's so difficult to define when something is, is false news, first, example, first as, it, as it's a very fuzzy content, concept, and secondly, when it's harmful. So legislate that will be uh, very problematic. Also, I have to say that while we do want the social media the advertisers and media, we want them to do more. It's clear that more has to be done. Uh, we have seen a lot happening already during this time. So we are rather happy of the process. Um, so we are uh, asking this code of practice to be drafted by July, by end of July, um, which is very challenging. And we want it to be committed to still during this year. We even want to measure results during this year. At the same time, we are setting up a network of fact checkers who can start looking at um, ways of kind of having a coordinated European approach with a European kind of uh, ethical code of who can be a fact checker and how then to share that news. The problem, of course, is that when you emotionally believe something, sharing facts about it doesn't help, as the previous speakers have said. But we are looking at that. And, uh, Underlying all of this is the other part, the media literacy part, that all member states, all stakeholders, everybody says that media literacy, making the readers, the users of social media <coughs> at all ages aware that they have to understand that this is a new world. What you read is not like the written word was before, that it's, we presumed basically that it's true. It's not true. It may not be true. So we have to find new ways to to make them understand that we have problems here. So we are doing all of this at a very uh, exciting and, and uh, high space, uh, speed with our stakeholders who are in the process and they seem to be quite motivated. The problem is, as was mentioned before, that as soon as we get these, these tools, as soon as we find solutions, those who benefit from different kinds of fake news are, are not stupid. Quite the contrary, they are in the, in the peak of development and research and technology. They find new ways. And then we'll need to have new ways to tackle it. So we will be doing this for a long, long time. But we hope with, with some effect. Uh, just one last word, because you asked about what, was, what we think about the different ideas presented first. Basically, we are looking at all of them. The one thing that we have kind of left out is one thing that was my favorite in the beginning. I was really interested and eager about this crowdsourcing. Because I was thinking that for every fact, there will be somebody who knows whether it's really true or not, every kind of reasonable fact like numbers. And I had a chance to ask the Jimmy Wales, of, who, the creator of Wikipedia, about this, because they have this. They have crowdsourced uh, fact-checking. And he said, no, it won't work, because the one thing that you didn't mention, I think, is that people have so many incentives of saying that something is not true, not because it would not be true, but because they want to say that it's not true. So our human side prevents it from being, being uh, possible. But I still live in hope, some kind of... Uh, game that will spread like angry birds and will, you know, help people click on truth or not truth. That, that would be interesting. But we are working on it on all fronts, from research and technology and innovation to collaboration, to policy and to all of it, possibly in the future, to regulation. But let's see here first how we manage with what we are doing now.
Thank you very much, uh, Annie, for uh, this uh, very detailed uh, overview of actions and ideas. And uh, I understand that it is a uh, very busy period, and uh, we hope that we will have the best possible outcome. Um, I'm sure that there are some comments from the panelists, but uh, because we are run out of uh, time, I would like to merge the comment session and discussion with some questions from the audience. So let's have uh, two, three questions for one round uh, and then if there is more time uh, more so um, I think the lady in the back was the first uh, to uh, so collectively three questions and then we answer and we comment also on what was said yes good afternoon my name is Yudi Kofola and I represent the Anta Josef Foundation from Hungary and I have uh, questions first to uh, the Facebook representative, to the director, managing director. You mentioned that there will be 2,000 people working on fake news. And my question is that, 20, oh, sorry, 20,000 on safety, exactly. And my question is, how are these people going to work? How are they going to decide what is fake? And if they find out that something is fake, are they going to turn to the justice system? This would be my first question. And the second question uh, would like to go to uh, the professor to, who is also coming and teaching at MIT. That you mentioned education and I'm really curious that uh, you didn't really mention how you are going to educate the young people because I think it's really important that as we, you know, already in high school, we tell them how to behave and, you know, there are challenges out there against dangers. Um, so is MIT is actually going to work out a program for the youth how to tackle with fake news? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there is uh, the, la the lady back there also. Uh, hi, my name is Mona Alami. I'm a researcher at the Atlantic Council. My question is to Annie. You spoke about uh, working on a code of practice and maybe a possible regulation of uh, of the field, but I'm just a bit surprised because when we talk about this information, we see that it's it's become a nuclear nuclearized type of warfare with thanks to social media that is actively used by certain countries like Russia. So is just having a code of practice or trying to reach out to uh, social media enough when we see that it's a very disruptive military measure that is affecting foreign policy, foreign policy of countries in our countries as well as elections? Thank you. Thank you. And the last question. Um, let's go to the gentleman in the second row. Hi, uh, Torben David with the German Digital Association, Bitcom. Uh, first of all, thank you all very much for, for being here. I have a lot of respect for people working on the tricky issue. Uh, my question goes to, to Annie as well on the code of practice that was just mentioned. Um, I was wondering how far, because you said that you assemble a large amount of stakeholders, uh, I was wondering how far that code, because it is also being measured by adoption against its success, uh, how far that code will also be applicable for those that are not represented at the table. So, for example, small platform. Yeah. Small platforms are not, to my knowledge, not represented in the drafting of the code of practice. So, and how far will those platforms have to submit to the code of practice as the code of practice is measured and the success is measured by its adoption rate? So that was just, yeah, to clarify that point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I will give the floor to Annie because she has some commitment and she has to leave. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to leave uh, at, at three. Uh, the code of practice, is it enough? I think that is, that is a good question, uh, as we see that there can be major, major um, consequences of this false information. Um, we hope that it will bring us somewhere, and we hope that it will be uh, a measure that will start a kind of kind of a new life of, of uh, tackling many of these issues, it will not be enough. It will not be enough for a long time because, as I said, uh, as soon as we find some solutions, some new issues will arise. But asking whether it's enough in a form that should regulation be better, um, I don't think that the regulation on this would, would kind of... Uh, what do we regulate? We decide that one must not put fake news online and then it stops. It's not going to work like that. So we believe that those measures that we are taking and the measures that we will be uh, kind of encouraging our stakeholders to take uh, will be good first steps on the way to, to 
tackle the problem. The world just grew too fast and we kind of, it got out of hand and we have to remember that social media is something very important for connecting people. So we must not uh, tackle issues so that freedom of speech is, is forgotten or people do not have this possibility anymore. But it is a very big issue and I hope as many people as possible say it because we need a lot of work and we need a lot of focus on that. Uh, the small, coming to the uh, other question, small platforms, uh, we have been uh, very eager to get many, as many platforms as possible involved. First of all, already in the high level group we sought for that. Um, they are extremely difficult to reach. However, we have the association of platforms, which name I don't remember, I don't know, Thomas, if you know the name. Yeah, that is on board and it is committed to share the information within its, its members to also have through, through their kind of commitment to have those members then also commit to it. And this means also a bit of delay in the kind of publication of it because we can have a draft code but then the organizations will have to go through their members. And the same goes for advertisers. So uh, we are aiming at a code to which as many platforms and advertising industry as, as possible will be able to able and willing to submit to. We have the civil society, the BELK and other civil society organizers at the same time reviewing that it's not a code with the measures that is, is too easy. So we want it to be real. Okay. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, so I understand that you have some commitments and we are free also, you, Effie. Um, but uh, there are some remaining questions to address. Uh, Marcel, I noticed that you were taking careful notes uh, in all the panel discussions. So uh, you can address the question, also comment on what the other speakers said and before I go to Thomas. Do I have to answer the questions? The other speakers, oh, that's harder, okay. <laughs> so. So you want to address a question about MIT? Or? So I'm very happy to answer the, the, uh, the question about education. So I would actually argue that there are perhaps two or three different solutions. There any, th any, thank you before you take off. I'm glad you came. Thanks for, thanks thank for the comments. I would have loved to stay here, but I have a flight to catch in the evening, and, and before that I have to go to work and take care of mm. a few things. We, are, uh, we have this platform, uh, this forum of uh, things, and we have the fact-checkers network, and we have the media literacy expert group meeting and we have research and innovation evaluations coming up so uh, thank you my colleagues will help with the mic thank, thank you so. and thank you for having me here. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for coming so, addressing the question in back about education so uh, i'd offer uh, two kind of classes of solutions one in terms of the basic education I would actually use the metaphor of trying to do research, right? When you hear a story, what do you think of the credibility of the claim? And then you also have to analyze the incentives of the person making that claim. So to give you a simple example, you know, if the Pope is, is supposed to be endorsing Trump, is that likely to be true? Uh, and then what's the credibility of the source that's actually putting that out there? So becoming an intelligent consumer, you often have to look at how much does that fit against what else you know? And then also, what are the incentives for the person making that claim to be making that claim? At the same time, I also want to point out that the number of instances in which that's a problem are legion, particularly in the context of social media or today's media environment. We suffer from a problem of information overload. So intelligently questioning everything you hear is simply an impossible task. So we have to recognize that's a real challenge. And so at a meta level, I would encourage consumers or you know, in the education process, I would encourage folks to really embrace a diversity of news sources as opposed to you know, a monochromatic view of news sources. If you see that, you'll see the world through a particular set of colors, and that's all you'll see. But if you are careful, if you're reading from Al-Qaeda, if you're reading from Chinese news, if you're reading from other press, you're more likely to come across competing views which will help you triangulate on the truth. So I would, I would say there are at least those two or three methods for trying to become more intelligent consumers. Thank you, Marcel. I'll come to you, Thomas, for the first question. Thank you. I, I think the question was about what are the 20,000 people doing? 
Um, the answer to that is that it, it's a wide variety of, of things that they're doing. Some of them are uh, content reviewers that review whether content is, uh, you know, is in line with the community standards that we have at Facebook. Others are developers uh, working on different tools uh, to deal with some of the issues we, we are talking about today, artificial intelligence or tools that enable us to see if things are, are spreading very, very quickly. Uh, well, maybe there was a, it's a good thing to get some eyes on that and have a fact checker look at it. Um, or other, other tools that help us drive the platform. So it's a very wide variety of, of skills and people that we are hiring, both to understand and analyze the situation and to create the solutions that, uh, that are necessary to deal with the issue. We do collaborate with, uh, with law enforcement on many different issues. We have um, collaboration and a platform for law enforcement to get in touch with us. So there is, um, there is a significant uh, uh, collaboration um, between us on, on issues when needed. Um, I, I know Annie has left, <laughs> but I still want to. I think I, I still want to say maybe a few words about the, the work that the commission has done because I think it's really important what they're doing. And um, we have had uh, some experience with with working with the commission over the last couple of years on a number of issues uh, with the approach that the commission has also taken on on fake news here, which is a, a self-regulatory uh, uh, approach. And I think we, we've done it on hate speech. We, working on, on, on terrorism issues, uh, we've done it earlier on child safety issues, and I think, um, I think it is actually uh, quite an effective method for working together and for ret uh, achieving results quickly, also quicker than the EU regulatory process normally allows us to. And I think that we need to remember that, because some people think that, well, it's just some self-regulation, so it can't be really important. Yes, it is. It is really important, and it impacts the work, the work that we do tremendously. Uh, we've learned from it, uh, and we uh, take action on it when, uh, when these initiatives are, are done. And we are also being held to account, not just on time, because, yes, they want quick results uh, on, on this issue, but also on whether or not the results are actually you know, delivered down the line. So I, I think it's actually a very uh, effective method of achieving results uh, in a world when, where, where things change fast. And if you imagine the alternative of regulation, and well, it'll take a while before that uh, regulation would kick in. Actually here, uh, we get to the results much quicker. Thank you very much. Unfo unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, more time. So I would like to invite you to thank the speakers for f being with us today. And uh, have a great afternoon.